scrap collectors. I hate these guys. I have finally found the holy grail of machinery. All of its secrets are revealed through the ancient texts. Four times the cutting speed divided by diameter. The width of the bolt deducted by the inverse of the threads per inch reveal all the secrets. Of the Holy Grail lay. They say the devil is in the detail. Now let's take a closer look at the stats and what makes this lathe so sought after. Here you can see the headstock and this provides a good view of how it interacts with the bed and as you can see there's no riser or any kind of riser blocks indicating that it was some sort of conversion that moved a 10 inch headstock up an extra two inches. This is an entirely separate and different headstock unit from the 10. Here we could see the spindle speed chart and it has a total of 16 gears that range anywhere from 28 to 2072 RPM. As you can see there are twin V belts here that have to be of the same length. This I would actually say is a weakness and shortcoming of this platform as if they're uneven it can cause loud noise, vibration, and a poor surface finish. So in all likelihood, if you're looking for a used one and it suffers from any of those problems, that may be why the person is getting rid of it. And you might not realize that these belts could be the cause. And a way to test for that is to take a piece of chalk and mark it and run the machine. If these lines, after some period, do not line up, that tells you that one of the belts is bad. Now replacing these belts with other V belts is a real pain as you've got to disassemble this whole spindle assembly. But there are other options available such as link style belts making it much easier to do. And of course the other thing you can see in here there is quite a bit of sawdust. And the sawdust is layered on top of all the other grease and grime, indicating it was the last thing that this machine was being used to cut for some reason. Moving down, we have the quick change gearbox, and it is capable of 54 feet from 0 0.0042, that's right, 42 ten thou, to a quarter of an inch, or 0 0.250 per revolution. That's pretty broad range. Additionally, in terms of thread cutting, we have the ability to do right and left hand threads from 4 to 240 TPI. Some people do a conversion where it basically changes the gearing ratio. This conversion essentially cuts the feed rates in half. Also available for this lathe is a set of gears that convert it to do metric threads, opening up a huge possibility of threading options. The gears in the gearbox are a unhardened steel. The safety clutch, as seen here, provides overload protection as well as any instances of things like the cutters or tool holders being ran into the chuck. Luckily, there's no evidence of that on the crossfeed table, so I know that this one has never experienced that. Now let's take a look at the gear train. I won't be running it because it is in need of some cleaning and restoration because it's a little bit tacky and sticky. And I don't want to be causing any additional damage or wear. Hopefully you can see that. Hopefully you can see those gears in there. So you want to take along a little mirror on a stick and a flashlight and you can look up and see everything. And if you run the machine, particularly on a slow feed, you'll be able to see each and every tooth. 
And if you can't, you can still engage in the faster gearing and rotate the chuck and see the entire gears. Here you can see the ubiquitous Atlas Lathe ba Gear Banjo, all of which are fairly dirty. And you can see the Zamac gears, so it needs a bit of a thorough cleaning, but in excellent condition. Further down, we have a belt pulley system. We have, you can see the shape of the V-belt and the engagement lever. I'm keeping it loose now because it's not being run more sawdust. And we have four positions we can select from. Here you can see the spindle threads. They're one and a half inches by eight threads per inch. In this view, you get a good look of the bull wheel, which has 60 indexing holes, as well as the locking pin here. Well, mine is a bit, oh, no, there it goes, stiff. This is another point of contention in which this is another trouble area to check. Some people will engage this when the chuck is stopped and try to force it off, damaging this bull gear. So you want to carefully rotate it and check all aspects and angles. This indexing ring is only to be used for setting up operations such as fluting, serration, sprocket, spoke, and gear spacing. Inside, we have, of course, the 25 by 30 second spindle bore utilizing a number three Morse taper. The English style bed here, of course, is flat. There is not a mark or problem here. There's a few raised spots, but that's not even corrosion. That's dried up grease. I cannot feel a single high spot or nick. And we ran a micrometer up and down, back and forth, and it was just as advertised, well within a thousandth of tolerance. Atlas advertises this bed to be precision ground on all of its bearing planes within one thousandth of an inch. And the bed is supposed to be a rigid structure of something called semi-cast, semi-steel cast iron. As you can see here, you can see the saddle as well as the cross. The Atlas is equipped with a reversible power cross and longitudinal feeds. These cross feeds are engaged by this lever. The power is taken off by a keyway and a lead screw through steel gears in the apron. It is smooth and easy going, despite being fairly dirty, requiring extensive cleaning. As you can see, 180 degree measurements all the way around. And there is not a single mark or damage on there, which is totally awesome. Sometimes these handles get snapped off and are missing, but it's all here. It has nice one and a half inch dials, though it could be a little bit bigger. Beautiful chrome work. Now I know for a fact that this lever here was an addition that came in after 1967. So this lathe cannot possibly be for 1967 because this replaced the standard uh, apron mounted mechanism here which to the chagrin of some people was absolutely bomb proof and a fantastic mechanism. From this view you can see the thread dial. It really does simplify thread cutting and shows exactly when to engage the half nuts. As you can see here, we have my tailstock. As a bonus, I got this totally awesome Jacob's chuck. Now, it is a number two Morse taper. It seems to be in pretty good condition. Um, as I said before, there, there's just a tiny bit of feel, but nothing terrible. And this lever here is, of course, not broken off, fully engages and locks the tailstock. Now, here's a bit of advice and something that I had done and almost got myself into a you break it, you bought it situation. 
I wanted to get a look in here. Really, the way I should have done it is taken a flashlight and shined it down in here and taken a good look. I thought I was being smart and then screwed this all the way. And I took it out. But watch what happens to the locking lever. It drops in, right? So I took it out, shine it out. Kind of confirmed exactly what I already knew by feeling it and getting a look down in there. It was unnecessary to remove this. I think I just wanted to check and see if there was corrosion. And then this one, there's like none. This is all like hardened grease or oil. So I tried to reassemble it. And guess what? It would not go in. In this lock, you can see that there are some cutouts here. And when the lock is engaged, these squeeze the, stem, the spindle. It is a heck of a time getting this back in. I was in trouble. So if you do get into that situation, line up the gap, and make it barely thread it on, and then you bring this one down and kind of hold this one and push in one of the directions of the handle and slide it around, try and, ah, there it goes. You get it in between the spindle. And once that's in, I can re-engage this nut here in the keyway. So I won't rotate. All right, and that's in there. I can then turn the hand wheel, and lock it, and we're good to go. One of the big things that separates the 12 inch lathe from the 10 or the six is the stand in the underdrive belt system. Unlike the 10 and 6, which have the motor hanging on the back, everything is self-contained in this portion of the cabinet. Atlas's literature claims that the stand is made out of steel and provides superior rigidity in combination with the superior and efficient twin V-belt drive system. The chuck is in excellent shape. The jaws that are on it and the additional jaws show no signs of ever being impacted. A tiny bit of staining, but really no corrosion. It is in beautiful shape and quite heavy. It is a Craftsman branded chuck. This one indicates that it is a model 101216518H. On the back here, it shows that it is made in England and displays serial number 8660. So I'm happy I got quite the nice chuck. Now, I know I have been geeking out a lot on this box. This price tag here shows a price of $62.99. One of the reasons why I'm geeking out is that. In that kind of period where I think this lathe came from, 1967 to about 72, just like 2023 was quite a time of fluctuating prices. Depending on the number of catalogs produced, that price may be matched to not just a yearly catalog, but to a catalog of a particular quarter, month, or whatever, once I can find that resource. And that would really narrow down exactly when this lathe was bought and sold. So let's crack open this cardboard skull and see what treasures are inside. Here again is another view of the box. And like I said, I'm shocked that this kind of perishable material would survive. I was trying to endeavor not to do more damage. So we have a HR I saw another one. Oh, here it is. And a HL Craftsman branded tool holders. Left and right. Both of them are stamped with this W, so I believe that indicates it was originally made by Williams. I've got this one's got a quarter inch high speed steel cutter in there. Got a chuck key. So it is uh, does say Jacob, so Yep, these guys belong together. Let's leave that there. Lathe key. This is in here. 
Ooh, that's nice. An original Atlas Presco wrench. It's got the for the square nuts. So these fit these. Hope oh, they do. That's cool. Uh, what else? Looks like four high-speed steel cutters, all quarter of an inch. Some have been you. Oh, they've all looked like they've been ground on and used, except for maybe this one. That chip tray. We have this little baby. The Craftsman branded, and it matches the rest of the badging here. Fishtail or thread gauge, 60 degree thread gauge. In pretty nice shape, a few little scratches. We have Jaws for the Chuck. Number one. Number three. Number two. And looks like 8660, 8, 8660, 8660. 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8. So these are matched to the Chuck. That's great. That is really great. And finally, a lantern style rocker tool post. I am eternally grateful, appreciative, and penitent of a man to have been able to rescue this lathe. And I'm really looking forward to preserving it and restoring it so it gets many more decades of precision use out of it. A less scrupulous collector would slap some oil in there and get it running right away. But this is an opportunity to understand and feel what it's like to operate a good quality machine from the golden age of American manual machining. So I'll be getting a deeper understanding about how everything works and I hope to be able to share that with you. And until next time, have fun out there adventurers, and remember, if it doesn't keep making chips, it belongs in a museum.